Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were sick and oppressed the devil. For God was with him, not because he was God, because God was with him. Who God? Holy Spirit God. Two Corinthians chapter 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We understand that God reveals himself as three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We had a look at that last week. I showed it from the scripture when Jesus was baptized. When he came up out the water, that is Jesus, who, according to John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, that Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Jesus is God. But you notice when he was baptized, a voice came from heaven. Who is that? That is God the Father. This is my beloved Son. So here we see Father revealed as a third person. He's, he's another person, the second so far. Jesus one, Father's two. He's in heaven. But what happened? The Holy Spirit came and descended upon Jesus and filled him at that moment. So there we see the Holy Spirit, a third person. Very often in the church we speak of God and the word says that God is one. But none of us says he's one individual, one person speaks of him as one, just as Adam was one. When God created Adam, male and female, he created them. And yet the woman part was inside Adam because when God put Adam to sleep, he took from him the rib and the woman became. And so that woman already existed. And so yet the Bible says when the two become one, when you marry, the two become one flesh. Now if we're one flesh, Janine and I are one flesh, but you notice she's sitting there and I'm over here. We're not co-joined in physical form, but we are one according to the Word of God. And just the same way, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. And we can get so focused on just God and calling the name of Jesus, I find that the Holy Spirit in a lot of circles, not here or any church we connected to, a lot of circles, the Holy Spirit's neglected. And it is so important to understand his ministry, to understand his part in our lives as the church. And here we see in this scripture again, the tripart being of God revealed. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. God is love. Amen. So there's the second. And then the communion of the Holy Spirit. There you can see the threefold nature of God revealed again. So here we see the love of Jesus Christ. That word Christ is important. Just take note of that. Christ is not Jesus' surname. Christ is a Greek word, Christos, which comes from the original Hebrew, Hamashiach, which means the anointed one. It's a description of who he is. Jesus, the anointed one. Keeping that in mind. And it says here, and the love of God, so grace of Christ, the love of God, and communion. Everybody say communion. Communion of the Holy Spirit. That word communion is the Greek word kanonoia. I'm not Greek. Please excuse me. I just have to remember what they say. And that word is the word used for fellowship. It, it, it's a very intimate fellowship. It's not just like, you know, I chat to you on the phone. It's the same way a husband and wife, when they make love, that is that word, that communion, that fellowship. It's intimate Fellowship, intimate love. It talks about this intimacy of the Holy Spirit. It's not just knowing He's there. There's an intimate relationship, communion, fellowship, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say intimate relationship. When you see Jesus talking about the Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, when we see Jesus walking in the earth... And we see the power that he walked in. We saw that he saw amazing miracles, tremendous signs and wonders, powerful word coming forth from him, demonstrations of the kingdom. 
And we called this year to see those manifestations of the kingdom of God. Well, how are those manifestations going to take place? Why did Jesus see so much power, so many miracles in his life? And it's easy to say, well, he's Jesus. He's supposed to. But you understand from Jesus himself, he says in John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Jesus said, him as Jesus cannot do anything of himself. So that thing where you say, well, Jesus did what he did because he's Jesus, out of his own mouth, he said, no, even as Jesus, I can't do anything. Notice, he didn't say, I, I prefer not to, and I choose to do it with someone else. He said, no, I cannot. On my own, I cannot do anything. Is that what you read? Say that Jesus said on his own, he could do nothing. So if that's Jesus, it will be good for you and me to admit that. You know, this thing about self-made man and I develop my own self-confidence and I don't need anybody. Uh-uh-uh. We all need somebody. Amen. Say amen. amen. Now, how come? He says, yeah, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, the son does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him how many? All things that he himself does, and he will show Jesus, the Father will show Jesus, greater works than these that you may marvel. Amen. So you're hearing out of the mouth of Jesus, he doesn't see himself standing on his own as God. So that whole Jesus only movement, that concept, is negated by Scripture. Because he says, on my own, I can do nothing. So I need the Father. So he's talking about another person. So the father, he says, whatever I see the father do, the father reveals to me. And because he revealed it to me, I can now do it. So he's saying, I'm the only reason I can do it. And notice as he says here, and the father will still show him greater works. Greater works. See, when Jesus was in the earth, you go to Philippians chapter 2. When he came into the earth, he was born a human. He was born into a human body as a baby. Now you do know, and I'm sure you understand, that in that baby body, he was a baby. It wasn't like when he was lying in the manger, you know, he's Jesus and he's always, you know, the mature, grown-up Jesus, but just in the baby's body and he's talking to the angels. Now that I'm here, we can go around and just remember we're going to do this in the next moment. They say, chips, here comes Mary. Now he's got to act. You don't think that happened. No, he was born baby, baby. He did everything babies do, throw up on mom and all that sort of, come on, isn't that right? The Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature. Stature means he physically grew up. Wisdom means he had to learn from the Word of God. Now, why is that? Because when you see in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in the anointed one, Jesus, Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, in other words, he is God, he didn't call it, considered robbery to be equal with God. So he said, I'm not going to, just because I am God, I don't need to grasp onto that. I, that. That's not what I need to be famous for. I don't need that as my badge. But he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, listen to this now, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. That word where it says there that he made himself of no reputation, in the original writing, the Greek words used there, talks about emptying himself. Emptying himself. If you read that from the Passion Translation, it says he existed in the form of God. Yet he gave no thought 
He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became a human. What does that mean? As God, he had to enter into the earth in flesh. We don't have time to study that out. It's because Adam, as a man, gave away the kingdom on the earth. And a man had to get it back. And so Jesus had to enter the earth legally as a man, because all authority had been given to man. And so he had to come in that authority. And so in order to be a true man... He had to empty himself of his power as God. Otherwise, the devil could talk around, hang on now, you're just coming as God. You can't fool me with that mask of flesh. No, he had to come as a man. So he, on his own decision, he emptied himself, completely became no reputation. That means all the glory and ability and the powers that he had as God, he left behind and then entered into the earth, born just as you and I would be born as a human. That's why the Bible says he was tempted in all things. You cannot tempt God as God. Jesus himself said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But as a human, he could be tempted. But he never gave in to those temptations. You see that. Then we read last week when he was baptized and he came up out the water, what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. Read the words. It says, like a dove. Come on. The Bible talks about Jesus being the lion of Judah. You don't expect to see him in heaven running around with a mane. And... No, he, it, it's a description. So the same way the Holy Spirit came like a dove and entered Jesus, what happened at that moment? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed. Remember, Christ means the anointed one. How was he anointed? God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit and with power. You read through the word, whenever you see power, you know the Holy Spirit's at work. So the Holy Spirit and power, and then as a result, Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were sick and oppressed of the devil. For God was with him, not because he was God, because God was with him. Who God? Holy Spirit God. So it's important to see that because when you understand that, you recognize when you see Jesus right all the way up to his baptism, you don't read of any miracles. Now, I know there's all kinds of traditions out there that as a little 12-year-old, he made a mud pie and then it turned into a bird and it flew away. I've, I've read that. But that's not in any writing of the Word of God. No, he, he was not able to do any miracles before. Why? Because he's not the one doing the miracles. He himself said so. It's only what the Father reveals to him. And so when was that revealed? When the Holy Spirit came upon him. And when the Holy Spirit was with him, now he could see into the kingdom of God. What he had been studying in the Word now was made revelation. And in that revelation, it could manifest. And so now when he called on the power of God, the manifestation, the miracles began to happen. The kingdom began manifesting. Yeah. Family of God, we are called to manifest the kingdom. Amen. The moment you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. Come have a look here. John chapter 16. Well, let's read John chapter 14 first. John chapter 14. So remember, Jesus said he will do greater works. John chapter 14, verse 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. How many believe in Jesus? Bump your neighbor and say, look at that, I'm in the book. This is you. And as the word speaks to you, you he who believes in me, say, that's me. You will do the works that Jesus did. Does he say that? Read in your book. The works that I do, Jesus speaking, you, who's you? The one who believes in me, who's that? You, you, say that's me. <laughs> Jesus says the works I do, you will do also. And listen to this. And greater works than these he will do. 
So Jesus is saying, you're impressed by what I do? You're going to do greater. That's something that if you understand this, when you read through the Word of God, that's why I have no problem with submission. A lot of people struggle with submission. They think it's some kind of control. But if you read through the book, every person that willingly submitted always landed up greater than the one they were submitting to. You'll see it all the way through. Joshua submitted to Moses. He took them into the promised land and conquered all the enemies. Elisha submitted to Elijah. He had twice the miracles happening in his life. You getting this? David submitted to Saul, even when he was evil. Oh, I can't, uh, he's a bad man. Uh, no, he knew he was God's prophet. Even though he was sinning, he refused to walk out of submission, even when everybody else was trying to tell him to walk away. This is my man. God placed me in his authority, and I may not need to stand with him or agree with him or run with him, but I'm not going to be the one killing him. In fact, the ones that thought he was doing David a, 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 a favor by killing him, they landed up getting killed. David said, you had no right to do that. And as submission to the king, he became known as one of the greatest kings. Are you getting this? So Jesus, in his submission, became greater. God gave him the name above all names. And so now when we submit to Jesus, the same works he did, out of his own mouth, you will do greater. See, he doesn't see that as a challenge to his deity. Why? Because he's speaking as a man here in the earth, as God in heaven. Who can surpass him? No one. He is supreme. But in the earth as a man, while he was a man, he says, as a man, you'll go beyond what I did as a man. Oh, come on. And the word says, if all the books in the world were used to record what he did, you'd never be able to record everything. Family, you and I are living in the season. Shout amen. amen. And notice verse 13. And because of this, he says, I go to my father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Why? That the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, here's part of the, the, the profile. Verse 15. If you love me, Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you a what? Another helper. Now, why does he say another helper? He's speaking to his disciples here. He is the helper to his disciples. Now, if you see me, now you think about Jesus in the life of the disciples. Whenever they had an issue with the word, they, he would talk and he'd speak in parables and they'd be just as dumbfounded as everybody else. Like, what is he talking about? But the key was that when they went home, they could sit with him and say, now, what did you mean there? And he would open it up for them. He would tell them what he was saying. You know a disciple didn't go longer than two minutes with a headache. I mean, he just had to go, Jesus, lay hands on me. Uh, they, 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 they had all their needs provided. They always had food. Come on, you with me? He had his hands on discipling. And he says now, I'm going to send you another helper. So you do know when he says that, he's not talking about another power. It's like, you know, imagine mom's looking after the child and says, you know what, I need to go, but yeah, I'm going to give the computer to look after you. The computer just won't do what the mother does. Come on. Any other object, even an a android, a robot or something, cannot have the love and compassion that a mother has. So Jesus is not saying, I'm going, I'm going to leave a power with you. He's sending another helper. It's another person. Everybody say, another person. So I'm going to send another person that he, not it, that he may abide with you forever. That he may what does that mean? Live with you. Dwell with you. Remember Adam in the garden? We learned last week. He, God walked with him, taught, spoke with him, fellowshiped with him. But in his sin, he was broken out of that fellowship. That's why God said, Adam, where are you? 
He's not looking for him physically. He knows he's hiding behind the tree. Give me a break. God can see him. I mean, really, like it's like your kids when you when they're little ones, they want to hide from you. You can see the the feet sticking out the curtain. Where are you? Where are you? And they, <laughs> they're still giggling behind the curtain. You know, Father can see where Adam is. But why does he say, where are you? Where's your fellowship? Where's your position? You've stepped away. You're out of fellowship. But notice he says, yeah, that when the Holy Spirit comes, that fellowship, that broken fellowship will be restored. Everybody say restored. Now, who's he talking about? He may abide with you. Verse 17, the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. Everybody say, Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Where is he dwelling with them? Right there in Jesus. While Jesus is speaking, the Holy Spirit is in him. So now the Holy Spirit's with them. But he says, but he will be in you. The way he's in me, he will be in you. Family of God, I say it boldly. The Holy Spirit is the most important person on the earth today. Shall I say that again? The Holy Spirit is the most important person on the earth today. Say that with me. The Holy Spirit is the most important person on the face of the earth today. Now, friend, maybe you were listening to me speak just now, and I mentioned those that will give their lives to Jesus would know more than the person that's most educated in the earth. And at that moment, you might have thought, that's me. I want to do that. I want to give my life to Jesus. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what your life's been like. I don't know what's happened. Because sometimes people will say, I don't know if God will even accept me. I've sinned. I know my life, and I've struggled, and I battle with religion. Uh, I don't know. I need to fix my life up first, and maybe that'll be one day. I don't know if it's today, but no, friend, put all of those questions, put all those thinking aside. Here's the thing. God knows you and me, and He knew we would sin. Get a hold of this. God knew that we would sin, and instead of getting angry, He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for your sin. See, God hates sin. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. And he hates sin so much that he sent his own son, Jesus, to take the sin that you and I committed. And he took it in his own life and he died on the cross paying for your sin on your behalf. He's removed the burden from you. And all you have to do today is believe. And the Bible says if you believe with your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead, you are made the righteousness of God. That's amazing. And if you confess Him as Lord, He is your Savior. And so we're going to do that right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. We'll all pray out loud together, but pray this along with me. Let's say this. Dear Jesus, thank you. You died for me. You gave your life so that I could have life. And then you rose from the dead. Today you're alive. I believe that. I call you Lord. You are my Savior. From this moment on, I live to serve you and to worship you. And Holy Spirit, you now live within my life. And I know I live the life as Christ lived it in the earth by your grace. And one day... I will leave this earth and stand in front of Jesus and see you face to face. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God, my friend. You're born again a child of God now. Congratulations to all of those that gave their life to the Lord today. What an amazing decision that you chose to make today. If that was you that made that decision, please go to our website and give us your details 
We have an awesome pack that we'd like to get to you today. It will help you build your faith and it will help you in your walk with God today. It's a free gift from my mom and dad that we'd like to get to you. Now, I'm sure you enjoy this really powerful teaching today, but there is way more available to go and learn and listen to. Go to our website and you can find more there and you can purchase it for yourself so you can listen to it wherever you are. You can learn more about the intimacy with the Holy Spirit and you can learn the benefits of what it is to be intimate with our Lord and Savior. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Joshua Bagg. You're watching Wisdom for Life. Remember, Jesus is Lord and life is a choice. Choose life. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Once the Holy Spirit had come, now the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the healing, delivering people was happening. God wants to do the same in and through our lives. He wants to anoint us with power to do His will. Family, the moment you're born again, the Holy Spirit entered you bodily. In this series, Alan Bagg takes us on this journey to cultivate an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. You'll discover the secret to the success of Jesus' ministry. You will learn the importance of being intimate with the Holy Spirit. And you will discover the areas that God is restoring in the lives of those who are part of His kingdom. You're going to see great power flowing through you. And as we learn to be intimate with the Holy Spirit, we're going to see many, many multitudes getting saved. Purchase your series and get in contact with us here at allenbagministries.org. The message you've been watching on today's program is part of an entire series that Alan Bagg recently taught at the Bay Christian Family Church. You can now get hold of this entire series by making contact with us here at Alan Bagg Ministries. Order your series and have all these messages available to help encourage and build your faith.